Well, ideas have consequences. And the false ideas about God in a culture have disastrous consequences for that culture. You see, whatever a culture worships, the God that it follows and seeks after, that God, if it's not the one true God, it will bring disaster to that country. You see, that God demands all allegiance to itself and all loyalty to it is due. And if it's not the one true God, then loyalty is being paid to an idol instead of to the one true God. As I listened to a candidate for county council this week, I was struck that his false ideas about human civil government were really a form of idolatry that he, as long with, along with many other people in our culture, have adopted. When he was queried, for example, regarding an elected school board rather than an appointed school board, which is what this county currently has, when he was queried about that, and by the way, an elected school board would at least make those people somewhat more accountable to the parents, not certainly to the degree they need to be, but at least one step in that direction. When queried about that, he replied that the school board should remain independent, should be appointed by the governor as it is currently because the school board knows best how to educate the children. It is their job to do it. In other words, government knows best. The parents do not know what is best for their own children. And therefore, you should simply trust the government. Just do what they tell you to do. Well, I posed a question to this particular candidate regarding the size of the police force in our county, as uh, was brought up several times in this meeting prior to my question, is that crime in our county has dropped significantly. There's far less crime than there were just even a few years ago in our county. And so I asked him, given that decrease in crime in our county, why he was calling for as absolutely necessary that we add 100 police troops to the current county force. And his reply was telling. He said the international standard for the number of police per resident in a county has been established and our county is 100 below that standard. International standard, excuse me, one size fits all. And so the conditions of our county are to be compared with, I don't know, some third world nation and we have to have the same standard that they have. His response was a statist response. That is a knee-jerk advocate for, advocate for bigger government, more intrusive government, and more police no matter what takes place in a society. And then I had one incident this week that further illustrated this thinking, this idolatry of civil government that I see in our land today, a government that has gone rogue in many respects. I had parked my car on the street of uh, Annapolis, and if you know Annapolis, it's very difficult to find parking, and so it's always a hassle. And I was walking back towards my parked car on the street when I happened to notice an unusual car that had one of these new license plate readers on the rear deck of the car. And I noticed it not just had the two that I've seen before, but this one had four. It had two lower ones that take pictures of everybody's license plate that it passes by or that pass by it. And then, of course, we know this is a violation of the Fourth Amendment as they store that information and send it on to other agencies and uh, spying on you, essentially, for simply driving down the public street. But what also caught my attention about this particular vehicle, it, it was parked illegally. It was parked in a tow-away zone, and the sign was right there, tow-away zone, where this car was parked. And so I happened to glance at the license plate on this vehicle, and sure enough, it was a government vehicle. It belongs to the city of Annapolis. And a few more steps down the street, I happened to see the meter maid giving tickets to cars who had overstayed their welcome in the lovely city of Annapolis. And so I called out to her that if she wanted to make big money with a big fine, she ought to go right down the end of the block and ticket that car and get a tow truck to tow that car away. At the moment I said that, there was a couple of guys working on the sidewalk making repairs there. And they said to, said to me, don't you know that's her car? And I said, what? Wait a minute, excuse me? That's her car that's parked illegally. And so I asked her, ma'am, is that your car down the end of the street here parked illegally? And she would not respond to my question that uh, I posed to her. And, uh, and then I queried, wait a minute, uh, this, is this just, ma'am? You can break the law while enforcing the law against the other people who are actually parked legally. You're enforcing the fines against those people? Are you kidding? 
That car was, belongs to the government, driven by a government worker, breaking the law. Of course, she wouldn't answer that question either. Here it is. Government sets the rules, and then it breaks the rules whenever it finds it convenient to do so. And the citizen, whenever they're out of line, they face fines and fees and maybe even time behind bars for simply breaking those same rules. What we have going on here and what we saw in this is two sets of standards. We have the master who does what he pleases, and you better listen to him, and his advice is always best in every area of life and their own set of rules that they operate by, and they can choose to break the rules whenever they choose to and obey them when they choose to, but not you. You're the servant. You are the serf on the master's land, and any time you step out of line, you are going to face the wrath of the master. And so the philosophy, both of the candidate that I encountered as well as the meter maid there on the street, the philosophy is this that government is above the law, that government is a God, so to speak, because a God cannot be questioned. A God establishes the law, and you had better simply obey it, or you will be penalized for doing the same things that the government itself does. You only have to ratchet it up a little bit further than that to talk about a government that is completely tyrannical, where you have absolutely no freedom at all. It was Benito Mussolini who infam infamously stated, our formula is this, everything within the state, nothing outside the state, no one against the state. And that's an idol. Saying civil government is God, you better bow down and worship it or else you'll pay dearly for any resistance to this totalitarian state system. And you know, in the history of mankind, that kind of tyranny is far more the rule than the exception. And we have seen in our country that the exception has been lost as we are turning into a tyrannical country. The children of Israel had experienced that kind of totalitarian tyranny for over 400 years as they had been slaves in the land of Egypt and Pharaoh the God King they envisioned him as. Pharaoh was God and he set the rules and everyone had to abide by those rules. No one could question his actions or his rulings. He was God. And so there was a law for the master and those who were, his, uh, uh, those were in his administration, a law for the government and a very different law for the slaves of Israel. And the people we saw cried out to God for deliverance from this injustice, from this bondage, from this mistreatment and this evil. And God answered their cries and he sent Moses to them. And Moses commanded Pharaoh, let my people go. Your tyranny is unjust. Your evil cannot be tolerated. Let my people go. And finally, when the people of Israel were freed in the Exodus, they scarce understood what had happened to them. After 400 years of being programmed as slaves, to even think about what it meant to be free, to be liberated was difficult. And so God began teaching them the lessons of liberty. And as we're studying the Ten Commandments, what we are actually studying is ten specific lessons in liberty. Turn in your Bible, if you would, to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20 is this morning we come to the fourth commandment, as I shared uh, with the children earlier. And this fourth commandment, by the way, is the largest of the commandments in terms of the number of words in the text in contrast with uh, the other commandments. So we'll be spending more than just a week examining uh, this particular commandment. And let's remind ourselves, as we're looking at this commandment, the context of the preceding three commandments, each of which are the foundation of liberty. Look at what God says in verse 1 of Exodus 20, just to remind ourselves here. Exodus 20 and verse 1. And God spoke spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And so the first commandment is very clear that worshiping and serving the one true God is the only path of liberty. They had been taught in Egypt for 400 years that Pharaoh's God, and you've got to worship him and obey him and follow Pharaoh. No, 
you're going to follow the one true God and worship the one true God, that is liberty. Worshiping and following idols will always lead to bondage, as it did with the idol Pharaoh. Then look at the second commandment that follows. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. And so the second commandment says, do not make any images of God, because if you make an image of God, you're going to have a false idea being imposed by uh, that image that you have created. In a sense, you will create a false theology, a false set of thoughts about God by creating an image. Again, this false theology about God always leads to tyranny in one form or another. If you were to visit the land of Egypt even today, you'll see many of those idols that they had created, those images that they had crafted, the Sphinx and so forth, and various images that the people of, uh, of Egypt were worshiping these idols, and those false theologies led them into abject bondage and slavery there in the land of Egypt. And then last week we looked at the third commandment, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. And what we say about God, our words about God, matter a great deal because God is the source of truth and God is the source of law. And so to denigrate God with our words is to disrespect not only his holy name, it's to disrespect his holy word, which is his holy law. And that's the reason why blasphemy was against the law. I know it's still on the books, but no one enforces it today. I think in Maryland, the last enforcement took place in Westminster, Maryland, 1968, where a fellow blasphemed the name of Jesus Christ on the streets of Westminster, and he was arrested for it and duly fined for it. He appealed his all the way up to uh, the Supreme Court and got it overturned, even though it's still on the books in uh, Maryland to our day. Why in the world was blasphemy against the law? Because to blaspheme is to publicly denigrate the one who is the giver of all law. In a sense, it's to be a subversive and to undercut the foundation of all law by uh, blaspheming in the name of the one who is the source of all law, ridiculing him and uh, cursing him. Well, this morning I want to show you as we look at the fourth commandment that uh, immediately follows here. In this fourth commandment, the issue really is one of ownership. Who owns your time is the one who owns you. And the issue of ownership is the issue between slavery and liberty. If you are owned by an idol and your time is devoted to an idol, you're not free. You are a slave. It is only ownership by the one true God, the God of Israel, that produces liberty. Who owns your time? When we think of a slave for a moment, before we look at this command in itself, think of a slave and we commonly conceive all of the time of this slave is owned by their master. And yet, the master doesn't control every single moment of time. For example, when the slave is sleeping. That may be the slave's only escape from the tyranny that they're experiencing. But when they're asleep, the master really doesn't control or own uh, that time, even though he might want to. The wise master of a slave would want to see that his slave got rest, and his slave got adequate rest and adequate nutrition in order to get the maximum work out of uh, his slave. Sleep could be the only escape, but the slave master is one who, like tyrannical Pharaoh, gets upset when his slave has any free time. Keep your finger there in Exodus uh, 20 for a moment and just glance back at Exodus 5 and verse 17. This is when Moses first confronted Pharaoh and said, let my people go that they may enter into the wilderness and worship the one true God. And Pharaoh refused and he got mad. Notice what he said when he got mad. Exodus 5, 5 and, and verse 17. Exodus 5, 17. But he said, ye are idle. This is Pharaoh speaking. Ye are idle. Ye are idle. Therefore ye say, let us go. And do sacrifice to the Lord. And very quickly, won't read the rest of the context, but he, he set a new standard. I used to supply you straw to make bricks. No longer are you going to get straw. Now you've got to work more hours every day and gather the straw yourselves to make these bricks. So he eliminated what little free time they had. The tyrant does not want anyone to have free time because in that free time, they may begin to think 
They may begin to look at the situation and realize, wait a minute, why am I a slave to this tyrannical master? And they may begin to think thoughts about liberty that are very dangerous for the tyrant to allow uh, to anyone to think. Look at the fourth commandment because it deals head on with this issue. Who owns your time? Exodus 20, uh, going back to Exodus 20 and beginning at verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Notice what this command is. It's rooted in the creation account. It's rooted in those days when God created all things that exist. And to understand what it means and how this applies to us, we really need to understand what happened there in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. So turn back to Genesis 2, which tells us exactly what is quoted there in the Ten Commandments. Genesis 2, and this is verses 1 through 3. Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, and on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So it says that God rested on the seventh day. Think about that for a moment. What does it mean? Clearly, it says that he ceased from creating anything new on this seventh day. You might think that it means God did absolutely nothing. And sometimes people want to define rest as doing absolutely nothing. In case, uh, perhaps if you were to apply it, that means and Sunday morning comes, and if that's your day of Sabbath day, that you don't get out of bed because anything else you do other than getting out of bed is not resting. Is that what it means here, that God rested on the Sabbath day? I think not, and I, I think we have indications in God's Word that that's not the case. Hebrews chapter 1, let me read to you from Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, where it is describing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and it says this about the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 1 uh, and verse 3, who being the brightness of His glory, that's the Father's glory, and the express image of His, the Father's person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, Christ's power, when he, Jesus, had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And this verse is saying a whole lot, but I just want to look at that one phrase, upholding all things by the word of his power. Jesus is the one who holds the entire universe together. It's really not the law of gravity or the laws of physics. It's the laws of Jesus Christ. His word is what holds everything together. You know, it's been a puzzle for researchers for some time as to how and why the atom stays together. After all, if you have an atom with more than one proton, you have two positively charged particles in the center of that atom. Why don't they just fly apart? We know that, you know, two positive charges aren't supposed to stay together. They fly apart. And how about the electrons circling around the outside of that atom? Well, we know that positive and negative attract each other and they come together, not stay apart. Why doesn't the atom simply collapse and all the electrons collapse into the, the, the nucleus? It doesn't happen. And it's a mystery. They really don't understand why, but they've kind of labeled it atomic glue. Well, Scripture tells us here what that is. It's Jesus Christ. It's the word of His power that holds everything in the universe together. And if he didn't buy the word of his power, it would all go apart. In fact, we're told at the end of time and the great consumption that's going to take place, this heaven and earth, all of it will burn up in a great fire. In a sense, Jesus will release his word and everything will disappear and burn up in a moment's time. Jesus is the one who holds it all together. And so if Jesus at any moment stopped doing that, this universe would no longer exist. The atomic glue would be gone and everything would fly apart. So while God rested on the seventh day, it does not mean he did nothing. He refrained from the work of creating anything new. He refrained from that work, but he did not cease from maintaining 
all that was in existence already, all that he had created in the previous uh, six days. One other element we see here very clearly in this commandment is this commandment is clearly linked with understanding that the six days of creation were all literal 24-hour days because the seventh day was a 24-hour day and we're commanded here in Exodus 20 to honor the, uh, to remember the Sabbath, which to remember and honor that 24-hour period once a week. I appreciate uh, what Ken Ham, his observation that we heard him share last week that our seven-day week is nowhere linked with the created order of things. You know, our, our day is based upon the earth turning on its axis, one complete turn, one complete revolution every day, and our month is based upon the moon and its cycles, its uh, 28 and a day, eight and a half day cycle around uh, the earth, and then our seasons are based upon the certain positions of our earth in relationship to the sun, and our year is based upon one complete revolution around the sun. All of these things in basis of our time are rooted in the created order, but the seven-day week is not. There's nothing astronomical creating uh, or forcing a seven-day week. The only place we know that we have a seven-day week is what we're commanded here in Scripture, in Genesis 1 and 2 and in Exodus 20. And so this pattern that God established of His work, six days of work and one day of rest, we're being told in Exodus 20 is our pattern that we are to follow ourselves. But we must remember that God rested not because He needed rest. He rested not because He was somehow tired and worn out and needed to rejuvenate and re needed to recharge His batteries because God doesn't need anything at all. He didn't rest to rejuvenate or recover from some strenuous work that He had done the previous six days. Now this, of course, is not the case with us as mere mortals. Whether it be physical work or mental work or even emotional work, it drains our energies. And unlike God, we do need rejuvenation. We do need rest to recover from a hard day's work and a hard week of work. And we need that basis, obviously, on a physical 24-hour cycle. If you miss a day of sleep, I don't know if you've ever done that. I have. It's not a pleasant experience. Your body cries out for that rest if you don't sleep within a 24-hour period. It longs for it so much so that you almost can't control yourself in terms of falling asleep. Uh, but God didn't need that. If we were to imitate God and His rest that He took on the seventh day, it means that we will take that space of time that we need to rejuvenate and uh, to recover. But it will include more than just rejuvenation and recovery physically. Because God didn't need that and yet He chose to rest on that seventh day. We'll see in this commandment that it is only one of two commandments in the ten that are positive in their nature. It's the fourth and the fifth commandment are the positive commandments. Instead of stating in the negative, thou shalt not, which all the other eight commandments do, it states positive, remember the Sabbath day. And the other part of this command, six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. And so it's not just about the seventh day, which is another mistake. I think people, when they look at the fourth commandment, they think it's just about the seventh day. Notice it's also about the preceding six days. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. So it's obvious in this command, God values work. In fact, you could say that our work matters to God. As a Christian, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, we ought to have a theology of work, a proper biblical understanding of the subject of work. Two friends were walking down the street one day and they saw an unusual sign in the store window usually see a sign that says help wanted they saw a sign that said no help wanted no help wanted hmm one friend turned to the other and said you know you ought to apply for that job no help wanted because you're really good at doing that no help you know poor fella but uh, he laughed at it we do not have a proper understanding of work until we have an understanding of what God has put us here on the planet for and what God wants us to accomplish in this world. In America, many people think the goal of work is to reach retirement. You know, I'm going to retire and sit around and do whatever I please or do nothing or just play golf or something like that. Not that any of that is wrong, but we ought not to have a perspective that says there reaches a point in time when I no longer work and I no longer have any uh, uh, employment that I am doing that is productive or useful. No, we ought to understand that all of our work, all of our activity ought to be bringing glory 
and honor to the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There was a group of Christians, and I don't agree with their theology. It's, it's much, much of it is distorted. But they had a proper understanding of the theology of work. They were called the Shakers. And uh, perhaps you've uh, seen some of their beautiful furniture that they produced, or perhaps you're familiar with some of their uh, inventions. And they believed that all of their work should bring glory to God. That's what they were about. And their work was high quality, and they worked with natural materials, and their workmanship was honored by many who would have no respect for their Christian belief system. And Shaker-made furnishings are not only beautiful and functional, but they're unostentatious. They're not over-decorated, which was something that uh, they were unique in. And uh, they invented things that we commonly take for granted today, like a clothespin, or uh, they invented the circular saw and the modern broom and many other things that we use today. But they had a right theology of work in spite of their other errors because they understood your work should glorify and honor God. We can, by a theology of work, of course, as we study God's Word, first discover that there are professions, you put that in quotations, professions that are illegal, that they're against God's law, and no one who is a Christian can be engaged in these professions. Prostitution obviously comes to mind as not legitimate work. Someone being part of an organized criminal conspiracy would also be illegal for a Christian to be engaged in. But we ought to look at some occupations that our culture tells us are perfectly legitimate, and compare them with what the Word of God, the law of God says, to discover if they are indeed legitimate for a Christian to be engaged in. For example, I would think today of the whole area of banking. That is, the way it's practiced in our day. Fractional reserve banking allows a bank to create money out of thin air and loan far more money than they hold on deposits, such that if all the people who are the depositors decided we need our money back now, they would say, we can't pay you. It's a bank run. We have to have a bank holiday. We can't pay any of you because it's not there. So that whole fractional reserve banking is a question mark, and I think there's doubt that it is a legitimate profession. There are many other examples I could cite because anything that is violative of the U.S. Constitution or the state constitution that's a government job is really illegitimate. So say Department of Education in Washington, D.C., the paycheck the person's receiving is ill-gotten gains. They're participating in a fraud of stealing from the American people to pay their paycheck because the entire thing is unconstitutional. It's illegal. So no Christian should be involved in any actions on the part of civil government that are a violation of God's law or a violation of the constitutions to which each uh, uh, person takes an oath who runs for office. So we need to take the whole area of work all professions and all uh, employments and put them under the microscope of God's Word to discover if they are indeed legitimate. And then, of course, in aspect of work, that we need to work and do our work to the honor of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And even the insignificant tasks of the day can be done to honor our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Appreciate what uh, Martin Luther said about this. He said, the maid who sweeps her kitchen is doing the will of God just as much, much as the monk who prays. Not because she may sing Christian hymns as she sweeps the floor, but because God loves clean floors. And he goes, the Christian shoemaker does his Christian duty, not by putting little crosses on the shoes, but by making good shoes because God is interested in good craftsmanship. And I think he's right. We honor God when we do what we do excellently to his honor and glory. And so this command tells us to do all of our work in those six days of the week to honor Him, to be diligent about our work as God's Word also commands us. Let me read to you from Colossians 3 and verse 23. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. And so in this fourth commandment, we need to highlight that word all. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. We should complete the work that God has given us to do, to do it well, not to leave it undone. Years ago, Pastor Harry Ironside told about uh, his experience as a young man. He worked for a Christian cobbler uh, for a time. And he said, my chief responsibility was to pound the leather for the soles of the shoes. A piece of cowhide would be put into, cut to suit and soaked in water. 
And I had a flat piece of iron over my knees and a flat-headed hammer, and I pounded these soles until they were hard and dry. And it seemed an endless operation to me, and I wearied of it many times. What made my task worse was the fact that a block away, there was another cobbler's shop, and I passed that cobbler shop going and coming from home, and there sat a, godly, a godless, jolly cobbler who uh, uh, re told ribald stories, yet somehow he seemed to thrive, and perhaps he seemed to do better than my own employer, McKay. I looked in his window, and I often noticed that he never pounded the soles of the shoes at all. He took them straight from the water, nailed them on, damp as they were, as the water squishing out as he drove each nail in. One day I ventured into that shop. I'd been warned never to do so, but timidly I said, I notice you put your soles on the shoes while they are wet. Are they just as good as if they were pounded? He gave me a wicked leer and answered, they come back all the quicker this way, my boy. That is, they wear right through because they're not hard. And he says, feeling that I'd learned something, I related the instance to my own boss and suggested that perhaps wasting time drying out the leather so carefully shouldn't be done. Mr. McKay stopped his work. He opened his Bible to this passage and read, whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Harry, he said, I do not cobble shoes just for the four bits and six bits that I get from my customers. I am doing this for the glory of God. I expect to see every shoe I ever made in a big pile at the judgment seat of Christ, and I do not want the Lord to say to me on that day, Dan, this was a poor job. You did not do your best here and here and here. I want him to be able to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Then he went on to explain that just as some men are called to preach, so he was called to cobble shoes. And only as he did this well would his testimony count for God. It was a lesson, he says, I have never been able to forget. Often when I've been tempted to be careless or to be slipshod in my efforts, I have thought of that dear, devoted Dan McKay. And it has stirred me up to seek all the more to do this for him who died to redeem me. We ought to do our work to the glory of God, to do it to the best so that people look at our work and say, that is obviously the best. And it's a witness and a testimony to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But now let's look at what is understood usually as the negative part of the fourth commandment, no work on the Sabbath. Actually, what we often see as a negative, the children of Israel would have seen as a great blessing, a great positive for them, at least initially. This was a tremendously freeing commandment. After all, think of their experience over the past 400 years. How many days a week did they work for Pharaoh? All seven. Every day was a day of labor. There was no break. There was no rest. There was no relief from this toilsome labor. The point of the fourth commandment is that God owns your time. God owns my time. And if somebody else claims to own us, then they're going to do to us what Pharaoh was doing to the children of Israel. We want all of your time. We demand it all. Think of this. The children of Israel were owned by the civil government of Pharaoh before God set them free and liberated them from bondage. Think of how much, for just a moment, your work is for the civil government versus how much your work is for your family or even for yourself. Many Americans face that 50% break where actually half of their time laboring is taken by the government in direct taxation. But it's actually worse than that when you think about it because not only do they tax you when you earn the money, when you turn around and spend the money, they tax you when you spend it. And if you decide to play and have some fun with the money, then there's an entertainment tax that they poke on top of that. And of course, if you decide, oh, it would be wise to save some of that money, invest some of that money, then they tax you when you do that. And if you decide, you know, I want to pass on some to my children, then they'll tax you in the inheritance process. And on and on it goes. If you retire, when you retire and start to draw out those funds that you have accumulated, then they'll tax you when you withdraw draw it. And of course, then they'll tax you when you're six feet under as well. They call it the death tax. And so while it might appear only 50%, I think it's much larger. And I see the mentality, especially in this campaign mode, you see the mentality of the civil government. They believe they own all of your time. All of your time belongs to them. And oh man, they're going to be generous and give you some of your time back. But they own it all. 
They're no different than Pharaoh in my mind. They believe they own you, and they believe they own your time, and your labor belongs to them. And so the fourth commandment says this, God owns our time, and He is the one that graciously and mercifully has given us one day of rest among uh, the seven. You see, civil government is never going to be that gracious to us. In fact, civil government will give you uh, only what it takes from someone else. You know, anytime somebody gets something from government, it's taken from someone else in order to give it uh, unto you. And so rather than us looking at the Sabbath as a burden or something that restricts us is actually very liberating. In fact, in Jesus' day, the scribes and the Pharisees had developed so many laws, rules, regulations in the Sabbath that the Sabbath became not a blessing, it was a burden. Let me just read to you from Mark chapter 2 and verse 27, Mark 2, 27, where Jesus was having a discussion with people about uh, their rules for keeping the Sabbath. And Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. In other words, the Sabbath was given as a blessing to us, not as a burden upon us. And yet the religious leaders of their day had made it a tremendous burden with all kinds of rules and regulations about everything in, in their life. For example, how far you could walk on the, on the Sabbath day. It was called a Sabbath day's journey. And if you wanted to work, walk farther than that distance of a Sabbath day's journey, the day before you had to prepare a meal, and you had to take that meal and place it at that point of the farthest end of your Sabbath day's journey. And then you could walk two Sabbath day's journeys. It's like kind of crazy, their system, but it became a burden to the people. Indeed, uh, very strict Jews of today follow the rules that they have continued to develop since the time of Jesus. One of those rules is you can't turn the light switch on. On the Sabbath, you can't turn the light switch on. That's work. And so you either have to do one of two things, turn all the light switch on uh, before sundown Friday night, so the lights burn for 24 hours, or hire a servant who will do that which is illegal for you to do. You're going to hire them to do it for you. It's like, wait a minute. Aren't you breaking the law by forcing them to break? You know, anyway, this kind of crazy system of the Sabbath becoming a burden is still with us today. But God gave his liberating command here that we could take a day of rest so that we would have that time for rejuvenation that we need. And the Sabbath is a tremendous blessing. It is not the burden uh, that we often conceive of it to be. And the people of Jesus' day had turned it on its head and made it a burden. And Jesus said that was never the intent of God, of God to make it a burden, but rather a blessing. His command brings rest from ceaseless toil in this world. And that rest is valuable to us because when we experience that rest, we gain the rejuvenation we need to face the tasks that are still ahead of us. There was two woodcutters who... Uh, decided to hold a competition one day, and they were going to see how much wood they could cut from dawn to dusk. And they both went out in the woods and began cutting, and the one was, uh, he would not cease from his labor except for a very brief time to eat his lunch. But he looked over at his fellow, and he noticed many times when he looked over, the other fellow was sitting down and looked to be resting to him. When the end of the day came, the fellow who had rested actually had cut far more wood than the one who worked continuously. And he asked him, what? Ah, that doesn't seem right. How did you cut more than I did? He said, you didn't notice every time I was resting, I was sharpening my axe. And by sharpening my axe throughout the day, I actually improved and increased my work rather than diminished it. And that's true for us as well. We need that rest which would enable us to rejuvenate and actually be far more effective when we are working. There was a famous man and he excelled in many, many areas of life. He was a painter, a sculptor, a poet, an architect, an engineer, and a city planner, a scientist, an inventor, a military genius, and a philosopher. And he said this, every now and then, go away and have a little relaxation. For when you come back to your work, your judgment will be surer, since to remain constantly at work will cause you to lose power of judgment. Go some distance away because the work appears smaller and the more of it can be taken in at a glance, and the lack of harmony or proportion is more readily seen. Those are the words of Leonardo da Vinci, and he was no slacker, for sure. He accomplished a great deal in his life. And you see, this Sabbath principle actually brings a blessing to us. God knows how we function best, and he knows it is best for us to work six days and to have one day of rest. As I shared with the children, the illustration from music. Musical rests are where no notes are to be played. 
And you might think that musical rest is non-musical, and yet it is an essential, integral part of that music, and the beauty of the music includes those points in time when no music is actually physically being played. And so it is in our Creator, who designed us and knows how we are made, that one day of rest in seven is what He designed for us. I think this might have been written a little tongue-in-cheek, but it's serious as well. There's somebody that wrote up rules for the coronary club and the ulcer club. You want a coronary, you want an ulcer, here's what you do. First, your job comes first. Forget everything else. Second, Saturdays, Sundays, and all holidays are great times to be in the office because nobody else, else is going to be there to bother you. Third, always bring your briefcase. Today we might update it and say your laptop or your, your tablet because it provides an opportunity to review completely all the troubles and all the worries of the day. Fourth, never say no to any request whatsoever. Always say yes. Fifth, accept all invitations to meetings and committees and banquets. Sixth, all forms of recreation they're wasted use of time. Don't do them. Seventh, never delegate any responsibilities to anyone else. Carry the entire load yourself. Eight, if your work calls for traveling, work all day. Travel at night so you can keep that appointment at eight in the morning the next day. And ninth, no matter how many jobs you already are doing, remember, you can always take on more. <laughs> That's a sure recipe for burnout. And we, if we follow God's pattern for our life, have those Sabbath rests built into our structure. The Sabbath principle liberates us from bondage. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Let's pray. Oh God, our Father, we thank you for the blessing that you bring to our lives. When we give all to you and you are our Lord and Master, your law becomes liberating for us because it's what is best for us. You designed us this way. So we pray that we would be given wisdom as to how we remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Father, we'd ask that you would equip us to serve you in this world, to be most effective, and to bring glory and honor to you in all of our work as well as in our rest. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would take your hymnal, let's turn to 575 to sing verse 1 of 575, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. 575. <laughs> What a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arms. Let us pray. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to our God who alone is wise, be honor, glory, dominion, and power, both now and forevermore. Amen. I invite you to join us back in the Fellowship Hall for coffee and snack this morning. Thank <laughs> you.